Good morning, Sakchi Sakdev. Welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Hi, Gareth. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on. I'm, it's my pleasure. Good, good. Well, listen, Sakchi, the, the best place to start is back in college. Um, I believe that you did a bachelor's in architecture followed by a master's in architecture. Is that correct? That's right. I went to a university called MS Rama Institute of Technology back in Bangalore in India, and I studied architecture. It was a five-year course. The last year was all internships. It was, I think, the best time of my life, to be honest. <laughs> um, ours was the first batch, I want to say, that um, did it differently. By differently, I mean we were the first people who started using AutoCAD and technology as opposed to hand drafting drawings. Very good. So that was a very interesting experience for sure. Good. So give, give, sorry, you mentioned there the last year. So how many years in total was it that you were studying? Uh, it was five years. The five whole years. course was five years. Yeah. So was, was it four years of book study and then one of year? Of course work, yeah. Course work, yeah. Four years of coursework and then one year of internship. So was that with a general contractor, with an architecture firm? How was that? So I interned with an architecture firm. There were people, although, who interned with general contractors because, you know, some general contractors have an in-house design team, but I purely worked with a, with a designer. We did a lot of uh, interior design stuff. And, you know, when you're a junior architect, they obviously don't want to they don't want to give you the responsibility of designing something mega. <laughs> so you're working on small pieces of a big project, like you're doing... Um, railings of a balcony the bathroom countertop maybe the kitchen cabinets or you're just basically giving your ideas to them in spurts you know and they're yeah. just improvising what you're giving them and making it better obviously with very, their experience very good and was it always your intention even before college that you wanted to do construction or were you on the fence of anything else whether it be it biology medicine so um, coming from India, obviously, um, you see a lot of folks going into IT engineering, all of my friends actually, but I was really inclined towards sketching, drawing, being artsy, crafty, making models. So architecture was definitely more enticing than studying technology for four years. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you, you saw construction as more creative and more sexy rather than IT. That's, that's, that's good because I right, think- Right, exactly. That's, that's exactly what it is. Because but um, now, now, of course, the story is different. You want to amalgamate the two and bring out the best. Yes, exactly. And I think that's the way to attract people, especially the younger generation, to try and get them into construction because all they see is the dirt and the mud and the hard hats. But in actual fact, the pre-construction side of it, the VDC, the BIM side of thing, it's really interesting and it amalgamates the both, but it also gives you a little bit more of, of creativity. Um, and then obviously you finished the master's, did your internship. Did you, you, I think you then went as a junior architect, is that right? Yeah, so right after architecture, I worked as a junior architect for two years for this company called RSP. It's a Singapore-based company, and they did a lot of um, these uh, housing projects in Bangalore. So I don't know if you know about Bangalore, but it's called the Silicon Valley of India. So there's a lot of IT professionals coming to Bangalore to work in like the back-end offices of companies like Amazon, Apple, Intel, enforces you name it so there's a need for housing communities which are at a certain level um they're they're located a little away from the center city and they obviously they don't have access to all the schools in the major part of the city so they started developing these micro cities which had their own school they had their own hospital within a gated community sort of so that was a very interesting experience for me with RSP. And that's what got me to do my master's in the US in urban design and planning. Very good, very good, excellent. And then at what stage, um, for instance, when I did my degree, my placement year 
the penny dropped that what I was doing, which was electrical engineering, wasn't what, what I wanted, wanted to do uh, when I finished. Right. So when did the, the penny drop and say, listen, architecture is great, but I want to be more involved in the pre-construction side, the estimating side, or even the, the, the project delivery? Well, um, to be honest, the architecture in India is very different from architecture here. Obviously, because the, the essence of architecture, the essence of construction is the same. But um, if you talk about specifics like um, building blocks, you, you, you use concrete building blocks throughout construction. Interior walls are made of bricks in India. Because obviously that has something to do with the tropical climate also. Mm -hmm. And here in the U.S., I mean, I don't want to elaborate about the U.S. because I'm talking about New York, especially. Yeah. In New York, we're doing a lot of stud walls. Mm -hmm. You're using a lot of wood indoors. Right. You're using radiators. Our HVAC system is completely different in India. We don't even use heating for that matter. So our plumbing requirement is completely different. Our mechanical requirement is completely different. So, um, so when I was working as a junior architect here in the US for me to like understand those things is obviously I can understand those things and implement them but I'm I'm I have five years of education in a completely different um yeah, environment you know, setting yeah. environment and setting and um you know in India once you finish your uh, undergrad in architecture and if you start working as an architect you are awarded a license in architecture but here in the U.S., it's very different. You would have to go through hours of training after you've completed your program and then go through like a couple of exams, I believe, to get your architecture license, right? Yes. So um, that was one of the things, you know, that made me realize that I got to do something different. Like I can't spend another 10 years trying to get myself um, an architecture license and then starting fresh. That's a lot of time. So instead of like going back to school, I decided to move ahead and look at what happens after you've designed, designed a project. It's, you start building it, you yeah. start constructing it. So um, that's, that's, where, that's where I, that's when I decided to like look at GCs, subcontractors, started working with them. Because as an architect, language, of architecture I understand what your vision is as an architect I see that you want to make a building that looks a certain way you have these ideas you have these design ideas and I can help you achieve that with in a different way right yes. I can help you price that I can get contractors to build it I can I know where what is on a drawing set you know how a drawing set is it has like it has 500 pages so like coming from an architectural background I'm able to recognize that um, all of the schedules at the back of the drawing will have, you know, the window details and the door details or the plumbing fixture details. So that obviously made it a lot easier for me to understand the language of architects and begin the process of construction and estimate projects. Yeah. Very good. So essentially you had to almost, almost on the job, retrain yourself into how things are done yeah. in the U.S. And how how, definitely, how, definitely. how difficult was that? What was your main, What were the main challenges involved? Um, to be honest, here in New York, it's a very global environment. People mm -hmm. are people are used to seeing other people come from different countries. Mm -hmm. So I w it would have been different in another state, another country, another city. But um, I love that New York City is open to everyone. It's very yeah. welcoming. Yeah. So people. People are not afraid to teach you. They believe in you. They have that trust in you. They, because they've done it before. They've worked with other people before. And obviously studying the master's program that I did at Rutgers University helped me a lot. Rutgers is an amazing school. I had the best experience, to be honest. And um, the master's program at Rutgers was an eye-opener because, because of how sit because I've never studied how cities are built before, right? I've done uh, micro cities in India. I've done the construction of those places, but um, the, studying the codes, the laws of a place, how much parking should be allotted, how much green space should be allotted is different for different areas, depending on the requirement, depending on what the population is, depending on what the temperature of the, what the 
political agenda is anything for that matter. So New York definitely made it a lot easier for me, for sure. Good, good. Glad to hear that. Because you've literally gone, you've worked with the, as a junior uh, architect in, in India. Then you've come here and you've actually worked as a project manager and an estimator. Um, yeah. Where does your career, where, where do you see it going? Could, do you see yourself in, I mean, it sounds like a design build kind type scenario would be perfect for you. Um, or do you have a passion for the project management side, project delivery, the pre-construction side, or the design side? To be honest, I started off with just, in my current situation, I started off with just estimating projects. Okay. Okay. But as the need arises, as you're talking to subcontractors, as the project starts, as the project manager of that project starts getting involved, he starts getting the subcontractors on the site, he's, he's talking to architects. They're looking at a contract which was essentially created by me a year before they started the construction, right? Yeah. Because that's how long pre-construction takes, right? because you're putting your numbers together, you have the requirements of the client, they are putting a schedule together, there's a budget in place. So just dis deciding on all of these things takes a long time. So by the time you're on site, you're ready to build, a lot of things have changed. Yeah. Budgets have evolved, the designs have evolved, the clients have met their friends and seen other buildings and they have different ideas. They have new things to add. Mm -hmm. The architects have built other homes and come up with new ideas themselves. There's an evolution of design, obviously. So the project manager will come to you as an estimator and ask you all these questions that when you estimated this, the price was so much, but now when I'm looking at it, I'm talking to the contractor, the price is X plus something else. How right. the client? So I gotta, you know, jump into that situation, talk to the talk to the architects, talk to the client, talk to the subcontractor, see what the current situation is, see how we can evolve, how we can make it work. So it's um, you know, you is, is you can separate separate the two but you also cannot separate. yeah and is that when that something like that happens is that where your relationship with the client with the architect and with the project manager is most important because we know as estimators we've got to be client facing we've got to be i always say we've got to have an element of, of to be able to sell something um how easy is that and out of the architect the, the client and the project manager what is the most difficult relationship throughout a project? Um, that is definitely true. Having good relationships with your client, architects, subcontractors is the most vital part of bidding a project or construction for that matter because people make mistakes, estimators make mistakes, subcontractors make mistakes, and even clients you know, they may change their minds later about the budgets. So to be able to communicate your thought to someone without offending someone or, you know, hurting their feelings. And it's, you know, because this is someone's home. Yes. I work in the residential sector. So people are really emotional about their homes, obviously. They, they want the best for themselves. And these are their ideas. You're building for them. This is not this has nothing to do with you this is all for the client essentially so so if you're not going to be honest if you're not going to be transparent if you're not going to share all the struggles that you're having with the rest of the team there's going to be issues for sure yeah of course and in this space in the residential space what sort of technology do you guys use um in estimating not much. We're using Excel. We use mm -hmm. Plan Swift. We use um, Plan Grid sometimes, Blue Beam sometimes, but they're all takeoff software. Yeah. And obviously, in the world of construction, time is literally money. So you don't have any extra to stop and reinvent and bring in new technology because every day, for every day that your labor is on site, your client is paying for it you're paying for it so there's no time to stop think rethink start again because time is very essential so 
So basically, it is very important to use the latest technology, but it's it's also very hard to incorporate it in the in the construction world at the same time. But we have to find a way to do it somehow. <laughs> there's always a way there's always a way you just gotta find it <laughs> and it's always up to the estimator to find out the reason and the method yeah yeah, uh, yeah. and what is it what is the most difficult part of being an estimator what are the main challenges you face on a day-to-day -day basis um the design changes obviously but that is part and parcel of a project it's it's part of the life cycle mm -hmm. so when a design changes, you got to go back to your subcontractors, ask them to reprice it. So this can happen not once, not twice, but maybe 10 times, 15 times, 20 times through a project. So when you have a contract ready and then you keep going back to the subcontractors to get new numbers and they've already won this job for you so many times, they obviously don't want to do this again and again and again. And you know, it's a thankless job. They're not getting paid to estimate the project. That's right. right? Yeah, yeah. So that is obviously the hardest part, but you just got to do it. Yeah, exactly. And we all know it's a stressful job. So what, what does Sakshi do um, to get away from it, to take her mind away from work? Um, she's in New York. What's the, the best uh, remedy? Mm, I love yoga. I mm -hmm. love cooking. I love reading. I love listening to podcasts. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot of things that I love to do when I'm not estimating. And obviously, it's hard to take your mind off things because you have deadlines and timelines. And like I said, time is money. So every minute that you spend away from your work, yeah. you know, you it's, feel, I, at least I feel like, you know, what am I doing? I should be working. <laughs> yoga really helps with something like that. Yeah, because yeah. that's, that's one of the main reasons when we talk to people that they select or, or choose to go down through the pre-construction or estimating rather than the project management. Because project management, you can be working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and then on a Saturday as well. Um, do you yeah. find that, and I know when a bid has to go in or there's a bid day coming up, you've got to work extra hard. Um, do you find that you, your, your day or your week or your year is nice and level or is it literally up and down depending on bids? Yeah, definitely up and down. There's a, it, if you look at it as a graph, it's, it's, it's going to be so wonky. It's, it's going to be a crazy <laughs> graph. But uh, it depends on the project, you know. When you're estimating on projects, there's so many different types of clients. There are so many different types of projects. Sometimes you get an architect who just gives you a sketch of what he wants. So you got to imagine the rest of it. You got to imagine like based on your own imagination or based on your experience with the same architect in the past, mm -hmm. past or based on what you think the client might like. Yeah. Um, so that can be tricky because um, this is not your home. This is someone else's home. So you need their input, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it helps that it helps to know architecture in those situations you know when you get a sketch from an architect and he's just giving you a basic idea of what he wants but there are no details of how it's going to be placed what it's going to be placed behind where it's going to be located where's the structural part of it so sometimes you just have to give it to them yeah. so you so you have to put it on your bid nevertheless even though the architect would not have accounted for certain things it's going to if he's gonna give you a fancy bathroom with all these plumbing fixtures and everything there's going to be a back into this there's going to be a complicated plumbing structure to it which is going to cost him money so sometimes you've got to imagine a lot of stuff so that that's challenging yeah yeah and, and that's where your experience across all three project management estimating and architecture that must give you a slight advantage um when you're dealing with your clients to be able to kind of put each hat on as you need to um so i know saski with the uh Taconic, uh builders uh, due to the COVID 19 um they laid off a few people and of one of which is yourself so what's next what's what's the next step in your journey um, I'm honestly very open. I'm open to what comes next because that's what happened when I was open um, the last time when I came to the US and I, I had all this architecture background. I was open to estimating and yeah. it, it went great. It was amazing. I feel like now um, I'd love to branch into commercial. Yeah. I've been doing residential for quite some time 
and um, obviously it has its advantages disadvantages you're working personally with a client who's making a home there's um, architects who have some crazy ideas they want to implement and a lot of these uh, clients of ours are high-end so even the designs that they implement for example one of one of our um, townhouses the fifth floor of the townhouse was completely made of walkable glass so that's not something you see on a regulars um so i guess commercial would be the next thing i don't know how creative people can get in commercial but i'm sure i'm sure there's... yeah i mean they, they do they, they get created um some of those big large capex companies they have a lot of, of yeah. money so they can get pretty creative and i would imagine that the kind of the step in the commercial would be more towards interiors first and foremost and then renovations and ground up after that would, would definitely that be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be better suited. So what's the craziest thing, apart from a, a glass floor, what's the craziest design you've come across? So many. This one project of ours, it it was essentially um, a barn from Texas, which was just assembled together, disassembled first, and then brought, flown in from Texas to the Hamptons in New York. We reassembled it. It took... a lot of days we had just two people on site getting this together and then imagine a barn being a party house essentially <laughs> so you go in there's a slide coming in from the first floor to the ground level and it's fully like you're you're talking about technology it's like the it's it's full of ipads on the walls it's all wired up you can ring a bell and it's going to ring it on another level it's just it's just crazy wow some, some, it's just a blessing and a curse sometimes to work with these architects because i would that's say what you get. yeah i would say that was a demand yeah. demanding client Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, listen, that's uh this has been fun- fascinating. Um one thing I always like to ask people, wh- how do you see the future of pre-construction? Is there anything that you would like to see changed? Is there any uh, historical stuff that you say it's a bit outdated, we need to be thinking this way? What's your opinions there? Definitely. Um I see a lot of my friends in technology here. who you know use data analysis they use pivot tables they use all sorts of tools available to better their businesses essentially so you know i i really believe that if we start incorporating those tools we would see a higher profit margins lesser risks lesser failures with subcontractors it's data is everything in 2020 so it's mm-hmm. high time we incorporated in estimating as well mm-hmm. and we have the data we've been working with these uh, architects we've been working with these subcontractors for a while we should be putting it together we should be using at least the basic ways of analyzing this data we could outsource it potentially mm-hmm. or we could or if or if we learn it that's the best case scenario Yeah, keep it keep it in house. I agree with you. You yeah. would you would actually enjoy my chat with the president of Beck Technology, Stuart Carroll. He was the first. They are actually the sponsors of the pre-construction p- podcast and he's got some fascinating insights in how their pre-construction software is going to go down that line in the future. Um but I agree with you. It's it's it has to be the future and and I'm sure it will be. It's yeah. just a matter of who's going to who's going to knock down that wall first and and be the first yeah. on the on the on to to be able to deliver it software ways. Um Definitely. good. Well listen, this has been uh this has been wonderful. Um where is the best place if someone did want to reach out to you? Um where are you based and how do we contact you? Or what's the best way to get you? I am in New Jersey and the best way to contact me is on LinkedIn. Good. Good. Um and I what I will do in this uh, when I'm putting this out on LinkedIn, I'll drop your details your LinkedIn profile in the comment section. Awesome. Thank you so Excellent. much, Gareth. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Speak to you soon.